Hello and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Today um, I'll be doing a discussion of a discussion of my of the games at Ethan. Hello and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Apologies for the delay in the video and for a bit of the picture quality. I've been experiencing some technical difficulties recently. I've had to switch my webcam recording so my recording software and various other stuff. So, hence the delay, changing picture quality, we'll see how this new software works out. Currently recording at night, but we'll see how this works. Over the next few videos, I'm going to be discussing my picks for games that were sold and unsold on at this year's E3. I'm not going to be doing a recap of my top five best of E3 or anything like that. We know kind of what games are tested the best, as far as for uh, the best response at this year's E3. We know that Uncharted looked ap Uncharted 3 looked absolutely fantastic. We know that The Elder Scrolls Skyrim looked fantastic. We know that um, that oh, Battlefield 3, lots of 3's this year that looked great. Um, Call of Duty, all of that. Instead, what I'm going to be talking about for tonight's event, I was on the fence, or just hadn't heard about them at all because they hadn't been announced yet, and from what I heard of this year's E3, heard and saw was promising enough that it made me want to get these titles. Later videos I'll be discussing the five games that I was unsold on at E3 where I came in interested in this title or again I have not heard of the title and from what I saw or heard no longer was interested. First up is um, on the sold titles was SSX Deadly Sense. I've kind of been a fan of the SSX series. I'm not a gigantic fan. I Rented the tight the games, enjoyed them, but never really bought them, never played them religiously or anything like that. But SSX Deadly Descent, originally, I was on the fence about it, particularly. It looked like they were dumping some of the silly, kind of over-the-top, but still kind of cool style from earlier games in the series, and changing it to something more kind of grim, kind of ultra-serious. Um... Which always felt always feels odd for any sort of extreme sports game of any kind. For what we saw this year's E3, very different. They are doing a certain degree of realism by basing the mountains and the tracks in the game off real world locations, which appeals to me, particularly since they're using mountains in my sort of home area of the Pacific Northwest. But also, it feels like that they have that fun there, but we also have a certain sense of um of Danger plus fun with, with the, the titular Deadly Descents, where you're dealing with mountain slide, with um, avalanches and all that sort of fun stuff, and dangerous dangerous mountain conditions. We'll have to see, I'll see more when a demo comes out. I'll actually get, get a chance to go on to get hands on with the game. As you, if you've been following my videos, you know I didn't get to go to E3, which, oh well, maybe someday. But that caught my attention, and I'm interested to see more in that series. Next up, um, next on the list here is Neverwinter. Neverwinter Night series is a game that I've been, I've enjoyed a lot through its installments um, by Bioware with the first game in the series, and with Neverwinter Nights 2, which is probably sitting. I haven't. Okay, Neverwinter Nights 2 is a bit more secondhand there, but. It appears to have done very well, and it's just a case of I want to play the game. I haven't been able to get the cash, cash together, get my hands on it. One of these days. Um, but it's a series which I've always been glad that it exists. I've always enjoyed the user-created content, and just rather the concept of user-created content. And Neverwinter Nights has really, Neverwinter Nights series has been a series which I feel that designers really get the concept of running a tabletop role-playing game. I've been I play tabletop role-playing games a lot. I consider myself a a polyglot gamer. Video games, tabletop role-playing games, board games, trading card games. I've played them all at some, times, at some time or another. And so when a game gets it right, as far as really gets the appeal of the game right, of, of the gamer type of game right, that always really catches my attention and gets me interested. And in the case of Neverwinter, uh, the Neverwinter Night series, they really get the concept of, of a dungeon master creating an adventure for his players 
based off story, uh, previous story elements in the game, um, or converting old dungeon or old, old adventures for a new rule system, like adapting the Tomb of Horrors to later editions of Dungeons and Dragons and so forth. The creators of the series have always gotten that, and my concern with Neverwinter is that because Cryptic is coming to this as an MMO developer, I wasn't sure if they quite get this in a way that would work for home players. And it looks like they've gotten that. I mean, they're familiar with the Dungeons and Dragons property. They created D&D Online. Um, they're going to customs to user-created content in the games for their stuff with Champions Online. And these are people who are definitely into the concept of the they definitely did tabletop role-playing games, but they did two MMOs based off them. But I was still a little on the fence with this game. And some of my concerns were alleviated, were eased for this title, with, with this title. So, and again, I'll have to see more as I get more gameplay footage and more information on it, but we'll see when we get there. Next up after that was Rayman Origins. I've never played any games in the Rayman series, so this is this isn't just isn't just a case of a game of a single game being sold on me at this year's E3, but an entire franchise. Not just the first Rayman game, but the rest of the series. Um, I'd never given them a second thought before, but what I saw at this year's E3 was enough to really make me want to kind of check things out, learn more about the series, and maybe hunt down a few of the earlier titles through. PlayStation Network or other places, and see how it really turns out, and see how good it actually is. I maybe end up becoming disappointed, but we'll have to see. That's up for me to find out for myself. Um, also, Ninja Gaiden 3 caught my attention here. This is the first game in the series not to be under the ha um, be under the creative lead and creative vision of Itagaki, who, in addition to doing the, de who did the earlier games in the series along with. The Devil May Cry, Devil May Cry, along with the Dead or Alive games and the, uh, the Dead or Alive Beach Volleyball games. And with the exception of Dead or Alive Beach Volleyball, Itagaki's had a very strong, this is for the hardcore mindset to it. In terms of very tight controls, precise controls, and requiring the player to use them precisely in order to progress with the game. On the one hand, I understand the appeal to this. There's a certain hardcore mindset in gamers that likes to have their like to be challenged. But on the other hand, I've never known the mindset that a good gamer is that motor coordination makes a good gamer. Um, and that to, in order to enjoy a game, you have to have really precise motor coordination. And it, it, it basically because it makes titles unapproachable. And to be honest, for all of the, the popular Ninja Gaiden series, it's always been a series where, to be honest, some of the difficulty in it is absolute bull bullshit. The early games had problems with monsters spawning at specific points. As far as, like, I'm just going all the way back to the NES. Monsters spawning at points where they were designed to hit you when you went over a jump. And all sorts of other problems there. Later games, they dumped some of the some of the, the difficulty problems with the um, with as far as like jumping and control and camera, though some of that's still there. But instead they replaced that with requiring super on some cases super precise difficulty with their games, and I'll be absolutely honest, I can't play Ninja Gaiden Sigma at any difficulty other than easy, other than it, the, the Ninja Dog easy difficulty, and even though I still have problems. It's not like I don't like these games, and this type of games, and don't play them. It's that the Ninja Gaiden series is perhaps harder than it needs to be. From the sounds of things from this year's E3, the new team running this game has gotten the message, and they're addressing this in this game. We'll find out more when the title itself finally comes out when we start getting, when we get a demo for this game. But, we'll see when we get there. Finally, the other game sold me on, and I'm 
Force Last Slot, I was originally really considering going with um, the new Devil May Cry game. But what? But then I saw the trailer and read game and read about the gameplay in Hitman Absolution. Hitman Absolution is a game which, frankly, is everything I've wanted in the Hitman series. Early games had a certain degree of stealth to them, a certain degree of right, creative thinking. Well, not just a certain degree of stealth. They were heavily focused on the stealth, in how not to be, in how not to be seen. The first games are very punishing in this, that, in that, if you have seen another mission, you're basically done. Later ones, they kind of tweak things a bit when you're dealing with civilians and other sort of stuff, where it went from, less from um, if anyone sees you, you're dead, to if if your target sees you, you're dead. But what this game really does for me is it looks like it's really giving an option for gameplay where if you're seen, you, you might still get through this. You you can possibly overpower your guard, overpower guards, take them on hand to hand, that sort of thing. In a certain extent, it's learns it's a game that's learned something from the Splinter Cell series, and the idea that, and for that matter, the Jason Bourne series, the films, where Jason Bourne he's good at blending in a crowd, he's good at through slipping through for slip, slipping through large groups of people, and not getting noticed, but if he's spotted, he can take out a potential um, apprehend, um, person who might try and stop him, be it law enforcement, be it guards for his target, or what have you, very quickly, very quietly, without needing to use a gun or anything like that. And so I, seeing the sort of Bourne-esque martial arts stuff and improvised weapon stuff in this really caught my interest. And for hopefully, this might be the Hitman game I've been really waiting for that scratches all my itches for stealth gameplay. And also a degree of sneaky action in a real Jason Bourne, real spy movie sense, as opposed to a Metal Gear Stolid, Tenchu Stealth Assassin's sneak and go hide sense. Again, when the demo comes out, I will be downloading it. I'll be giving it a try, and I'll, I'll give my, some of my thoughts here. But again, I'll learn more later. But from what I've seen this, what I saw and what I read it, about it this year's E3, this was a title that really piqued my interest. So that's it for my uh, soul for my top five sold games of E3. Next video will cover my unsold. The games which basically totally soured me on them, and my shame of the show. Um, check the feed for for those. Feel free to post in the comments on your thoughts on these. And look forward to seeing you next. Then again, any feedback, anything I can do to improve, any recommendations for different screen capturing software or anything like that. Feel free to post that as well. Currently, I'm using debut video capture software. If you have something better you want to recommend, feel free. Post that. Thank you very much. I look forward to your feedback, and see you next time.